Sí, ya está grabando. Ya, aquí podemos ver cuánta gente está. Entrando. Vamos a esperar un momento, ¿no? Estamos 30 atendidas ahorita. Good afternoon, everyone. We're just giving everybody one more minute before we start. We would like for everybody to mute, please mute your microphone so we don't have background sound. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, we're very excited to have Amy Cáceres. I just wanted to uh, give you some uh, um, guidelines for the questions. Amy will uh, answer the questions at the end of her presentation. Um, you can type the question in the questions box on your uh, um, monitor, and or you can raise your hand and you can um, ask a question later um, at the end. And uh, Miguel, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Miguel Fernandez. I am the director of the Latin American and Caribbean programs. I'm delighted to have Amy Cáceres today to give us a, a little bit of um, an idea of what they are doing in the Amazon in Peru. Um, this is part of a webinar series called Pools of the Planet that is a joint effort between EcoHealth Alliance, um, Geobon, and the NatureServe Network. So, Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, willing to, to, to talk to us. Thank you. Okay, uh, Miguel, uh, well, thank you for that uh, introduction. And well, I also want to thank for the invitation to do this presentation and the initiative that is doing uh, NatureServe, uh, the Geobon and the EcoHealth Alliance with this uh, webinar series, The Pulse of the Planet. And I hope that you all we're, uh, are going to, to enjoy the presentation. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, begin introducing myself. My name is Amy Cáceres. I am a Peruvian biologist, always have been interested in conservation. And um, for the last two years, I have been working for a conservation NGO based in Peru called ACA, by the acronym of Asociación para la Conservación de la Cuenca Amazónica, or Conservación Amazónica. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit of what we do. Uh, this presentation is just a second, having some troubles. Oh, okay. Uh, the presentation is going to be about the work we do uh, in the in the Amazon. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the organization, which uh, what is our mission, in what areas we do, we, do we work, uh, in what areas do we, do we work? What are our strategic areas? And finally, we're going to talk a little more in detail about how we use technology uh, to tackle uh, conservation issues in the Amazon. 
first of all, yes, let me pass that. Okay, Conservación Amazonica is a Peruvian NGO, a non-profit organization, that we are this year we're going to to have 20 years of working in the in the Andes Amazon and one particular uh, characteristic of this organization is that we have always worked uh, locally we are very present uh, we have a high presence in 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 the in the local areas where we work so we have an office in Madre de Dios in Puerto Maldonado the capital of Madre de Dios and then in Cusco uh, and we are interested in achieving the conservation of the Andes Amazon of southeastern Peru. Our mission is to integrate innovation communities uh, to pre protect the Andes Amazon, that is one of the most diverse areas on the planet. Uh, and here comes where, where do we work. Uh, we work in, in this landscape. This is a map, map of uh, Cusco province and Madre de Dios province in the area where we work. And we work in this amazing landscape that, it's, uh, that has a large scale conservation areas, different conservation units, different uh, people, different uses of, 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 of activities, indigenous terri territories. Uh, and especially why we work in this area, because of the Andes Amazon. Uh, we have been always interested since the moment we were funded uh, in conserving the place where the Andes and the Amazon meet. And why is this place so interesting in a term of biodiversity? Because in a relative short least distance, 200 kilometers in kind of in a straight line, you have a, a very, a very mark change of elevation uh, that can go like more than 2,000 meters uh, change and that's what made this 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 area extremely uh, diverse extremely biological diverse uh, but also uh, cultural diverse with the presence of different indigenous groups and we focus our efforts in four strategic areas. Uh, one of them is protecting natural areas. Another one is empowering people. And another one is, the last one is putting science to work. That is the area where I specifically work. Uh, in protecting natural areas, we do mainly three, three things. Uh, we support the creation of natural protected areas. Uh, we support technically and financially uh, local communities and governments. And we support our stakeholders. I'm going to explain this a little bit more extensively with some examples. One of the examples is the creation in 2017 of three new conservation areas in Cusco that together they add, add up more than 45,000 hectares. That's the Tres Cañones, Alto Pilcomayo, and Matoriato. Uh, and we, we, we support this process, uh, support the government in the creation of these natural protected areas, all the way through the process of, of doing them and declaring them. Other thing we do, as I mentioned before, is we support local local communities and our stakeholders. What do I mean with this? I'm going to give the example of the Amaracaeri Communal Reserve. The Amaracaeri Communal Reserve is a very interesting type of natural protected area because it has a co-management structure that it's a, where the, the reserve is managed by the, by the government through the National Park Service, the CERNAMP, and it's also managed through an indigenous-based organization known as ECA, that is Ejecutor del Contrato de Administración, ECA Amarataeri. The very interesting about this organization is that it's an indigenous-based organization, meaning that all the people in this organization, the directives of this organization, are, are selected by the indigenous community, the 10 indigenous community that inhabit the 
and Maracayeri Communal Reserve. And they, together with the government, do the co-management of the, of, the, of the protected area. I think this system is very interesting. Peru right now have 10, of, 10 communal reserves all over the, the country. And Amaraqueri Communal Reserve is uh, working extremely good. We have been lucky enough to participate uh, with them, to develop projects with them, especially in building capacity, not only management capacity, since from an account, account, accounting, finance, or administrative point of view, but also, for example, biological monitoring capacity. At this moment, we have a project that is ending, that it's relating with uh, the monitoring of their hydro, hydrobiological resources. We have also have projects related with, the, the, with conflict resolution in the use of natural resources. And uh, we are also uh, studying projects for the use of technology so they can monitor and control their lands against threats. Other of the areas where we work, other of our strategic areas, is uh, empowering people. What do we mean by this? Uh, it's giving people uh, the, the means and the capacities to be, to be, to be able to, to do the different activities that will allow them to have a sustainable living. And a very interesting part of this this strategic area is that it's actually where the organization was born. Because 30, 20 years ago, we started here with this tree that is the Brazil nut. The Brazil nut is a very interesting tree. It's a very interesting species because it's one of the emergent trees of the Amazon. It has a height of more than 50 meters can live very uh, high lo uh, longevity, like 500 years. And it's only present in some parts of the Amazon, being Madre de Dios, one of the provinces in Peru, being the, actually the province in Peru that has this, this species. And it's also the only wild nut in the world. This is what the Brazil nut produces. It's this very hard nut uh, that inside have this, well, inside this very hard shell, has this, this very nice and, and tasty nut that it's only, only produced during the rainy season of the Amazon, that is between uh, November and March. Another interesting ca characteristic that this, this species has is that it cannot be plant. It has to grow in the wild. So you cannot have a plantation of Brazil nuts. So in order to have Brazil nuts, you really have to conserve and maintain the forest. This makes this species very important for any for a conservation initiative in this area. So and also the species is very important for different any animals. We have since the the poison the Brazil nut poison frog that uses the empty shells of the Brazil nut fuel with water to lay its eggs to the agouti that has a love relationship with the Brazil nut because the rodent will be able to crack this very hard shell, get the nuts, and sometimes he will go and hit the nuts underground, acting as a dispersal of this species. Um, we also have the harpy eagle, another eagle, that use that, the, the tree as nesting areas, nesting places. And um, finally, we have humans. 20% uh, of the population of Madre de Dios province depends on Brazil nuts. Uh, and here is where we, we started working, in this dependence between this population that want to maintain the forest in order to have a living and, and the forest itself. Let me introduce to you to Sarita Hurtado. Sarita Hurtado is one of our beneficiary of the project. We have done uh, all, the, all the different steps in order for Sarita Hurtado for having a concession to go all the way to developing new, new products uh, with, with Brazil. One of the first things we do is uh, the organization of the stakeholder lands, uh, the, then the improvement of the production chain, and how from the moment they collect the nut, the Brazil nut, all the way to, to drying and, and, and selling the nuts. 
also transformation, the transformation of, of the nuts into more value-added products. Uh, and finally, capacity building for the protection of their, of their concessions. Uh, uh, one thing I really want to explain a little bit here is about the term concessions. Uh, here in Peru, we have this legal figure where the government will give a concession to a private person. And this person uh, will be in charge of this uh, piece of land to do specific activities. For example, in the case, case of Sarit Hurtado, she has a Brazil nut concession. And in this concession, uh, she, can, she can harvest Brazil nut. Uh, Conservación Amazonica, we have a conservation concession uh, that is Los Amigos, that we were given by the government in order to conserve that forest. So this is one of our initiatives that is the Brazil nut work with the concessionaries. And then we have another initiative uh, that is the strategic plan for the buffer zone of the Tambopata National Reserve. Uh, this, this strategy, uh, this initiative is focused in, in the buffer area of the Tambopata National Reserve located in Madre de Dios. And what we do here is uh, we want to we we want to to like organize the the land the buffer zone. Uh, and what seems very interesting about this is that it's a bottom-up initiative. It's a kind of initiative that I really I really fond of because it is an initiative that came from the local people that are living in those areas. Uh, all the way up to try to make it uh, in the long term to, into a national policy, meaning that uh, all the local actors proposed and implemented uh, different actions that will allow the organization and maintenance of the buffer zone and therefore the conservation of the national reserve uh, with sustainable activities. So this this, strategy, this initiative in the in the short term has uh, different uh, projects that the different organizations that are involved, including ACA and other organizations and also the government, are already developing in the area that are related with agroforestry, fish farming, recovery of degraded areas, tourism, diversification of, of activities in the different uh, lands, environmental education, participative monitoring and strengthening capacities. And in the long term, it looks to, to include the government through ministries in order to, to make it replicable in other natural, natural protected areas, uh, in the, in the, not only in Madre de Dios, but in the, whole, in the whole country. Then we have putting science to work. Uh, in this strategic area, we have three, three major, major uh, issues that are addressed. First, we have a system of biological station for science, research, and education. Then we use technology to detect threats. And then we provide technical knowledge for decision makers. How about our biological station? We have three of them, as I mentioned before. Uh, they are located in the landscape where, I, where we work. This is the map that I showed you before. Uh, we have Los Amigos in the lowland Amazon, then Villa Carmen in the montan Amazon forest, and finally Waikecha in the cloud forest. And these, these three stations are located in the, in the middle of our work area, in the middle of all these landscape of different conservation units, indigenous territory, territories and different land use practices. And they are, uh, they are located following this elevation of gradient from the Andes to the Amazon, that is a very high biodiverse area, as I have been mentioning before. We have the first one from going from the highest point to the lowest point, that is the Waikecha Cloud Forest. That it's a, also, it was established in 2005. Uh, it's also a private conservation area. It has around 500 hectares, and it has different habit, uh, habitat types, uh, including cloud forest, puna grassland, and elfin forest that are these very 
short, short trees uh, forest. Then we have, following the grading going down, we have Villa Carmen that has 300 hectares. Uh, it, Amazon mountain forest also has bamboo forest, has agricultural areas. It was established in 2010. Um, and well, it's uh, Waikecha and, and Villa Carmen are located in the enigmatic uh, and very famous bird watching destination known as the Manu Road. And finally, down in Madre de Dios in the lowland Amazon, we have Los Amigos, that is the oldest station we have. Uh, it was established in 2000. This station is next to our conservation concession and the station has only 450 hect hectares, but the concession has more than 145,000 hectares. And the most important habitats are the fruit plain, the terra firme, pound swamp, oxbok lakes. Uh, Los Amigos is, is really, really a very nice place, very, for me, very special. I always like this part of the, of the Amazon. And um, well, we we do research uh, in in the tree of the station. I'm going to share one. Uh, I'm going to share one of the projects that we have very briefly. We have an habitat views on this erosion of terrestrial birds in Los Amigos. We have been doing this project with the with the objective to understand how how these birds use uh, the habitat, especially in the case of the tinamous that are. Uh, a very is an endangered endangered group because they are big land birds that are usually hunts, uh, but they are also very difficult to to study because they are they are very shy. And in Los Amigos area, we have eleven species of the forty-seven that exist, and we have been we have set a a grid of camera traps to try to understand the habitat use and the distribution of these birds. And it has been very interesting because uh, we have found uh, how they behave, behave related with different habitats, but we have also found other like behavior or predation events that you will usually not see through point counts or other types of methodology. Uh, so I want to share with you a video if I'm able to play it, about some predation events that we we register for for Tinamus. This is a great tinamu nest that was predated in in the lapse of one month, I think, one month and a half, by everyone in the Amazon. This is a Aira, Taira Aira, Taira Barbara, Aira Barbara. A white road comes. And even my mouse. <laughs> Okay, I hope you have enjoyed that. Uh, oh, sorry, starting again. So, another very important feature of our biological station is that uh, for over 20 years we have had a scholarship program. Uh, this program had, 
had awarded the scholarship to 256 uh, grantees uh, for developing research in one of our biological stations. 68% uh, of these grantees were Peruvian. And it's very interesting to see that since 2000, how this, the impact this scholarships program has had. Uh, some of the, the grantees that were given a scholarship when, when they were students uh, are going back to the station taking their own students. And also uh, in the last years, uh, the scholarship has focused mainly in Peruvians in order to give an opportunity for, for Peruvians, students and young researchers uh, being able to, to do a research project in, in the Amazon. Um, well, I think it has been a great opportunity for a lot of them to develop in their professional career and conservation careers. And now we are going to use, uh, to talk about the use of technology to identify threats. Uh, uh, here, I think, is a part that maybe most of you is going to be very interesting, that is the technology use part. Um, Actually, let me give you a little bit of context of what is happening. Uh, we see, at least in Peru, or well, in the world, we see a lot of, of in Peru in the last year, a lot of deforestation has been happening. And we see these different news appearing uh, in different media about what is happening with deforestation in the, in the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, and, we have a, the main threats we have is deforestation per se, that is the complete cut of the trees and forest degradation, that is when you produce that because of illegal logging. Uh, Peru, as I mentioned, has been suffering a lot of deforestation, but this has been particularly dramatic in Madre de Dios province. This is a photo uh, taken from in Madre de Dios, of one of the camping mine, gold mining camping areas. Uh, this, all this area used to be like this amazing forest that now is completely gone. And all of this because this, of this white, sorry, of this gel, golden mineral that everyone is crazy about that it's gold. So in the last years, Madre de Dios has experienced a dramatic forest loss as we can see by the statistics, uh, the official statistics of, of the government. Uh, so it's, it's a big, big problem. So we, know, we need to know, in order to tackle any problem, we need to know how, when, and where it's happening. That's why we need to monitor. And that's how uh, the project, uh, Monitoring of the Anden Amazon Project was born, this initiative. That is initiative between Amazon Conservation, that is our United States uh, partner, and Conservación Amazonica. And this initiative, this project works in two scales. The first scale is <coughs> satellite monitoring, that I'm going to explain a little bit further later. And then on the ground monitoring, the other scale, through drones and apps, like the alerts issue by Geo Bosques, that is the government uh, organization that uh, reports and documents deforestation uh, in the country. And the map produces two types of information that I'm going to explain briefly and then more in detail uh, following slides. One of them is the map report. We have published 95 uh, uh, unedited uh, unpublished reports. Uh, and these reports are open to everywhere, to everyone uh, that in our site for the MAP project. Uh, and then we have also published, only in 2008, not published, but we have produced 21 policy briefs. What is the difference between a policy brief and a public report? The policy brief is confidential. It sends to specific organizations in the government and it seeks uh, action for this organization to seek action. Why policy briefs are confidential? Because they have a, they have a delicate information for someone. And I'm going to explain 
later why why they are why they are confidential. Uh, the map the map project uh, it's a near real time deforestation monitoring initiative. That the main goal is to produce technical information in a timely manner in an easy to understand format, in a format that everyone can can read especially people that are not in the academia world. The geographic focus of the project started in Peru, uh, but it has always been the Andes Amazon. started in Peru, but has expanded to Colombia, Ecuador, and Bolivia. And it is based, the information usage is based in mainly five satellite systems, Landsat, the Planet, Digital Block, Sentinel, and Perusat. And the intended audience is researchers, public at large, media, policymakers, civil society. This is the map for, especially for the open, the public report. <coughs> and how our methodology work? Uh, first, we do an uh, detection and identification of forest loss. And this we do it through, through alerts that we receive through satellite uh, and through satellite imagery. And then we do a prioritization of the information. All the alerts that we research, receive that are of thousands of areas of points, we have to determine which one is the more important. Uh, and this can be done in a different, using a different uh, set of, of of consideration, for example, the threat, the area where it happens, uh, and another one. And then we have to, to determine the drivers of this deforestation. Are there humans or there are natural events that produce these, these forest loss? Finally, we, we have to communicate, and we use it through our map reports or to or through, through policy brief, it, it has it needs to be confidential information. And finally, the political response. Uh, the, the idea is that all the previous steps in this process can take to, to an action, to something be done for the conservation. Now I'm going to talk uh, briefly uh, about five uh, examples of the map reports. The first one is, is about a national trend. Uh, it's a map report that was done for all the country, uh, where it was it was done about the deforestation hotspots in the Peruvian Amazon in 2017. And we identified different areas that are having very high deforestation hotspots. Here we have in the central Amazon of Peru, in the Huanco area and the Bayali area. <coughs> And then we have another one in, in Madre de Dios, uh, probably for because of coal mining, as I have mentioned before. Then we have an example when uh, the, a map was done using uh, for extensive agriculture. This map was based in oil palm and deforestation done by oil palm. It was found that agro-industrial crops uh, has been directly related to the deforestation of at least 30, more than 31,000 hectares since 2000. This map was done in the area of Loreto and San Martin and Ucayali. Then we have an example of how the map can use other, other tools uh, to detect threats. In this case, we we, we assess logging in the Peruvian Amazon using very high resolution imagery of digital log that has less than 50, cent 50 centimeters compared to that 30 meters that has Landsat or the 3.8 meters that has planet. And we identify different, uh, the different phases of logo, logging activity, illegal logging activity in, in, in the Peruvian Amazon since the settling of camps and also roads, and well, if you enter to the site to see the map, you will find the uh, roads, camp, uh, the site where they had, and even the, the transportation uh, areas, or that area where they go and start st 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 stacking the, the, the timber. And another one, 
example is of other tools is the use of radar. Uh, radar has been very useful uh, for detecting, for monitoring the forestation in the Amazon because in the rainy season it's very cloudy and radar allow us to see beyond the, the clouds, the cloud cover. So we have been able to overcome this difficulty by using this, this kind of technology. And finally, we have an example of a national protected area, and that is the Maracayeri Communal Reserve. Uh, and well, the threats of coal mining in the, in the Maracayeri Communal Reserve. And we can see the difference between two thousand in only one year, the difference of in the first station from 2016 to 2017. But okay, producing all this information is great, but actually, how can we use it? Okay, we are sharing it with people, but uh, sometimes that might be enough, or maybe that might not be enough. We have provided technical knowledge for decision makers. Uh, and here is a little bit where it comes a policy brief. Uh, one example is that we provide this policy brief to the National Park Service and the Peruvian Forest Service. And uh, it, this policy brief usually has information about deforestation and forest degradation in protected area and other sensitive areas. Uh, it is confidential information that goes directly to the government. Why? Because this information, this way that government can use this information to, to, to make an operative, to go and, and, and stop that action in the natural protected area or in the sensitive area. And it's also useful because it allows uh, to make a, a control activity uh, more, more effective and efficient. We have also been working with the environmental, with the national prosecution, especially with environmental prosecution, uh, in giving information in environmental crimes, uh, in natural protected areas, indigenous uh, territories, and concessionaries. And in this case, we we are trying to go a little bit further, not just providing the information, but we're trying to to make that this type of information, I mean, uh, produced from satellite imagery and drone imagery can be used as evidence for environmental crimes. So yeah, it's also great to share the information, but oh, it's not changing. <laughs> Second. Okay. Uh, all this information is great, and it's also great to share it uh, with, especially with the government and with with other organizations that might be useful for them. But it's also important to build capacity and empower local people. I think it's not enough, but we we know how to obtain and to to process it, to analyze this information. But it's also important to show to other people to do it, especially the people that are going to be needing needing it more. So in this scope, we, we have different, uh, different initiatives. Uh, we have been building capacity with government office. Uh, this is a case of the satellite monitoring unit of the environmental prosecution. Uh, there are three of them, of these offices, that are in the three great Amazon provinces that are Loreto, Cayali, and Madre Dios. Uh, one was last year created in Lima in order to coordinate the efforts of the other three that are located in the Amazon. And we have uh, implemented train, uh, the one that is in Madre de Dios in Puerto Maldonado. And how have we done that? We have, for example, the technician, the, the person in the, in the photograph is the technician of the satellite monitoring unit of Madre de Dios. And we have trained him in the use of all this technique in obtaining this information so he can produce information that can be used by the prosecutors to, to investigate and to prepare a case uh, against an uh, environmental crime. And this way they will be able to produce their own information and also have the information put in a way that it's easier to understand for the prosecutor. A simple example. 
when you receive a, a, a complaint, uh, you usually you will have a coordinate points. But if you see those points in, in a paper, that, that doesn't make any sense for you. They're just numerical points, GPS points in, in a document. But with this unit, they will transform those points into a map. And this way, when the prosecutor sees the document, he, he has a complete different view of, of what it's he, see, he or she is seeing. He sees a map with areas that, this per, that the prosecutor already knows have a better idea and understanding of what, what is happening. And another thing is uh, we empower people, local people, uh, by, by making them stronger in being able to monitor their own concession, their own concessions. All in this photo we have different concessions owners, including Sarita that is seated here, that are receiving a, a training uh, a training, training course in the use of drones to monitor their own concession. And in this way, we have uh, two projects that are studying, that are in this scope, that is well, building capacity to monitor the forestation and threat to, to forestry in Brazil, not concessions in Madre de Dios, that is being funded by NODA and Google. And the idea is that to make concessions able to monitor their own concessions about threats and to get, and be able to to have the information needed to present a complaint with the uh, environmental prosecution uh, office and then we have another project that it's uh, it's working with the Maracaeri communal reserve um, to to incorporate technology in their uh, monitor activities of their of their of their communal reserve and these two projects are an example of how we are trying to, to build capacity and to empower local people in the use of technology. So they can also take advantage of the technology to, to protect their territories against, against threats. And well, with that, I will finish the presentation. Thank you for listening. And I don't know if you have any question, please feel free to, to ask. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Amy, for a brilliant presentation. Now we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can raise your hand within the system, we will know that you would like to ask a question. We will unmute you. Um, in the meantime, we will go to the, to the written questions. So the first question uh, is from Sol Fernandez. The question is, uh, taking into account the huge expansion of gold mining in Tambopata buffer zone, what type of measures ACA considering to obtain successful results with its strategic plan? Sorry, can you repeat that? Absolutely. Taking into account the huge expansion of gold mining in Tambopata buffer zone, what are the what type of measures uh, ACA is considering to obtain successful results with its strategic plan? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, like at this moment regarding illegal gold mining, we have, well, we are monitoring and we are also with a strategic uh, plan we are doing about the buffer zone. Uh, what we hope to achieve is give an alternative to people, a sustainable alternative to people uh, of activities that they can do. Uh, we have beneficiaries uh, that we have already been working with in agroforestry projects that they used to be miners, but they are not interested in mining anymore because they realize that uh, that maybe it's not an activity that has much future for them. So they they turn into agroforestry. So for us, that is a very successful result. Excellent, thank you. There is another question from the audience. Um, I will I will admit, um, the person who's asking uh, Thomas Thomas Moore. Um, let's let's go ahead with your, your question. Can you can you hear me, Thomas? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I guess, um, I guess Thomas doesn't have a microphone, so um, Saul, Saul, can you hear me? I will uh, uh, unmute you. Oh, right. Thomas, there you go. Thomas, uh, can you? All right. Um, I had two questions. The first one was, since the Durban uh, conference of the parties in 2003, the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity have recognized uh, areas and territories uh, governed by indigenous peoples and other local communities as other uh, protected or conserved areas. Uh, but very little has been done about this uh, in most countries, including Peru. Uh, right now, uh, Sir Trump says this sort of thing should be done by the Ministry of Culture, and the Ministry of Culture says it should be Sir Nam's responsibility. So neither one is assuming it. What is the position of uh, Conservación Amazonica in, in this regard? What can be done given that a lot of indigenous controlled territories throughout the Amazon basin, and particularly in southeastern Peru, um, are threatened by uh, mm. mining, uh, oil and gas development uh, projects, uh, hydroelectric dams, roads, uh, illegal uh, uh, timber extraction, uh, Etc. Uh, as well as drug trafficking, what what recommendations does ACA have on this? That's the first question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your question, Thomas. I'm going to answer you both in in, in the in the expertise I have, but it's not much. Uh, what we we think uh, we are trying to do is that. We, for example, I think that the co-management uh, system uh, can work and could work. Uh, and I think that the Amarakeri Comuna Reserve is a good example of that. Uh, of course, it would be great if the government as such will take a more active action in, in assuming and, and giving indigenous uh, people the rights that they should have over the forest. But I think that initiatives of the communal reserves are are good, at least at a good starting point, because there's something that that is start and they just need to to start building up. And I think in the case of the Amarakaeri, that could be a good example of it. And what was your your second question? My second question is: given the threats mm -hmm. of deforestation in Brazil under the new government. Is there any, are there any plans for the MAP program to expand into Brazil? Uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that question uh, because I'm not, a, I'm not the director of the MAP project, but I can surely give you the mail of the person that will be able to answer that question. Okay. Yes, if it's Matt Finer, I'm in contact with him. And the problem yeah. with the communal reserves is governance. Uh, Sernam controls them vertically and offered what is in effect co-administration, which they call co-gestion, to the ECA, but not co-governance. And that's a problem for the indigenous Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, please, um, we have another question from, from Sol, Sol Fernandez. Please, Sol, go ahead with your question. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a question more about academics, and it's regarding of the MAP projects. Um, it's about how much or is your goal uh, doing research projects about how much this loss of forest cover is influenced with two uh, dynamics of the biodiversity, like trying to relate both parts the, the results that you have in the map projects with the other part of biodiversity dynamics? Okay, uh, we, in the map project, we, the objective, as I mentioned, is like to produce information, family information. We have had some, some specific uh, initiative for doing more academic related. But at the moment, I don't think it's a major goal of the project or to turn into that. 
That doesn't mean okay. that we cannot collaborate with someone interested in, in doing that. And, uh, and according to our resources and availability, we cannot do something like that. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. Now we will um, unmute Raul Mauricio. Uh, he has a question also. Go ahead, Raul. Okay, I'll try to speak. Uh, I have a problem with this now. Okay. ¿Me pueden escuchar? Sí, Raul, te escuchamos perfectamente. Okay. Uh, in Castellano or in English? How do you, uh, it's the same, you translate, please, you help me? As you prefer, absolutely. Okay, okay. Uh, gracias, me encantó la presentación. Mi nombre es Raúl Mauricio de Perú. He sido el primer fiscal adjunto supremo ambiental creador de las FEMAS. Tengo algunas preguntas y recomendaciones. Primero, el uso satelital es muy buena herramienta. Desearía saber cuáles son las limitaciones para una tal específica. For example, Cuando yo saco cinco o tres especies forestales y la otra preocupación, ¿por qué considerar a la policía si ellos no son el titular de la acción penal de un delito? La policía, desde el punto de vista procesal, es simplemente el apoyo. Mi gran preocupación es que muchas veces esta información relevante para un policía muchas veces termina en corrupción, por lo que yo recomiendo es que esta información sea directamente pasada en directo al coordinador ambiental, al fiscal ambiental, que es la persona recomendable. Y una, y una segunda pregunta es que el control territorial es muy importante para las comunidades nativas, pero esta estrategia es muy buena, sí, pero no tiene la herramienta jurídica. Por lo que yo recomiendo es que dentro de la comunidad, ese veedor forestal, sea reconocido mediante una ordenanza regional, pero con el apoyo de un abogado, pero especialista en asuntos comunitarios, porque la vida comunitaria requiere de trabajos y de conocimientos interculturales. Por lo demás, esto me parece una maravilla, es excelente, pero creo que esta gran herramienta se puede colocar dentro de un sistema de prevención que todavía el Perú no lo ha construido. El Perú lo que ha construido es como dedicarnos solamente a ver el delito consumado, y eso llegamos muy tarde. El control territorial me permite avisar, pero necesitamos prevenir. La prevención yo creo que es el paradigma, y esta es una herramienta muy buena. Por favor, si lo puede tradu traducir, muchas gracias. Ok, um, it's, a, it's a long... Um, <laughs> Is, uh, you have wrote uh, a summary of your questions and recommendations in, in the in the questions window, but I would like to ask Amy, please, and, um, uh, give us your thoughts on, on what you just mentioned. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Raúl. Gracias, Raúl. Uh, I'm going to answer in English, I think. And then we'll That's right. It. No problem. I'm speaking oh, English. Okay. okay perfect. <laughs> Uh, okay. I kind of confused because in the whole presentation I never never mentioned I never say the word police. Yeah, Not okay. once. So I think there was a miscommunication problem there. We yeah, okay. do not pass we do not pass the information to the police. We work with the environmental prosecution and it's confidential information in this okay. case. So but I do understand I completely do understand your, your point and your and your concern. Completely. Uh, and well, thank you for, for the other comments, too. Okay, perfect. Now, um, we will go to Carla Julieta Herrera. She has another question. Car uh, Carla Julieta Herrera, I can unmute you if you want to uh, make the question. Go ahead, Carla. Carla Julieta, you are unmuted now. You can ask your question, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're having some issues with um, the communication with Carla Julieta Herrera. I can ask her a question. Is the answer of the government positive? I mean, do they act uh, like they're supposed to do? Do they help you defend the land? That's her question. Oh, okay. Uh... I think it depends. 
it depends. I really don't want to get into politics, but uh, I, I mean, like in any Latin American country, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, of the actions that you are able to take uh, depends more than in the institution itself, in the people in that institution, and the willingness of that people to do, to change, to produce a change. And I think that's the same in Peru. And in that case, we could say that, yeah, we, we re receive support uh, in some specific areas or from specific persons and from a uh, government office too, and in another, not that much, or it could improve. Excellent. We have one last question from Thiru Selvan. Please go ahead, Thiru Selvan, with your question. We're having some problems. Um, he has uh, also uh, made his question in writing. How can conservation be promoted among the local community who are the main stakeholders and users? I think that will depend on the, of the community, the area. So it's a very broad question. Uh, I think that will depend on the community, the area, uh, the area where you are and the opportunities that you have. Uh, that can be like really, really, uh, it's a very broad broad answer that it will have. Uh, personally, I think that a, a really strong way to, to promote conservation is uh, to give an opportunity to people and to empower people. Because I, I don't think that all the, the initiatives that come uh, Top down are the ones that work the most, but those that come uh, bottom up, what the people really want to do with their, their territories and their forests. Uh, I think that will be my answer. Excellent way to end uh, this webinar. Thank you so much, Amy, for, for your time today. We were delight, delighted to have you, um, and thank you again. Okay, um, there is no more questions from the audience. We will um, stop this webinar. I uh, thank all the participants, attendees that were able to listen. If you haven't, or if you have colleagues who have not been able to attend, we will post this recording on our website it's called Pulse of the Planet, Nature Serve. You can also find the recording at the Geobon website as well as the EcoHealth Alliance website. Thank you so much and stay tuned because the next month we will have a, a webinar on uh, a very interesting topic also re really connected to what we presented today, which is about restoration of degraded uh, landscapes. Thank you so much again and um, looking forward to see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Bye.